On our first video featuring this 1975 TR6, we did an overview and mechanical inspection. Now at this juncture, we had wrapped up a ton of jobs, including pretty much everything underneath the car. So this will be the first of a two or three part video examining all the work we did to the car. Today, we'll focus on all the jobs underneath. Next up, we're gonna dive into the engine bay and then the interior. Since we have it up on the lift and wrapped a few things up, I figured what a great time to go ahead and grab the cameras and just walk you through some of the things that we took care of and some of the additional things that we found. Now we may have mentioned this already, but as we went through the vehicle, when we did that initial inspection, well afterwards I did a deeper dive inspection, we wrote up a report uh, for the owner of the vehicle and we found a number of things that we didn't cover in our initial video. Furthermore, as often happens with classic vehicles, we found additional things as we dug into the items we were working on. So there's a few other things that we took care of as we went along. So what we're gonna do is just show you with our other camera here, some of the things that we found, and we'll talk a little bit about any of the notes or interesting tidbits of the repairs that we did. So like usual, we're gonna start at the front of the vehicle and we're gonna go ahead and kind of stick our camera up in here. You see, there's our original OEM horn and that's actually still disconnected though we did run some wiring to it. We'll show you some pictures of that from above the car. And then here is that air horn uh, that we were going to remove, but we ended up keeping. So with the horn, what we found was actually bad wiring. The wires and original wires were just so degraded, the grounds were kind of poor, and the relay itself was starting to have some issues that full voltage was never quite making it to the horns. So when you hit the horn button, that kind of uh, that you would hear was actually the compressor on the air horns attempting to spool up and it was spinning so slow. If you stayed on it after about a second or two, you'd get a little bit of an air horn sound out of the horns. It would basically get enough air to, to toot the horns, so to speak. Now the original horn was still hooked up but had not enough power going to it. When I tested them, we were only getting about 10 volts to the air horn and only about seven volts to the old horn. And the way the wiring was done, it was basically going from the relay to the air horns and then a bridge wire going to the original horn. Now I went and ran a new test wire straight from the relay and that solved a lot of the problems. We were actually able to get both horns to go off separately, but not when they were connected in series. We were still having a bit of a voltage drop. So I did try a brand new relay, just a standard automotive relay out of the box, and that actually solved it completely. We had full voltage going to the horn, we cleaned up the grounds, and now when you honk the horn, that compressor spins up super fast and the air horns blow in like a quarter of a second, they're blowing. So they're pretty much perfect and they're nice and loud. Now the original horn, still pretty bad even when you're running full power to it it's super quiet it's definitely worn out and needs to be replaced and i did put a whole new set of wiring a new set of bridge wires to it and unfortunately when you have the power of the main horn going the other horn just doesn't want to go so what i'll do we're going to return it to the owner with a working horn and i think that they'll like the air horn it works very well and is very loud if they do want to go back to stock horns, we're going to actually have to replace and buy two originals or some aftermarket ones because all that's left in this car is, I believe, the low tone, not the high tone. So the end result is we do have a working and nice loud horn on this vehicle. The big question is going to be for the owner if they want to change it at all, but it's definitely safe. And I think the horn sounds pretty good. All right. So uh, another thing that we worked on before we go any further back was our was our auxiliary lighting. And on the auxiliary lighting, what we ended up doing was running complete new wiring. We went ahead and wired in some connectors. So now we can actually remove the lamps if we want to. But the best thing about them is now they have a uh, two 14 gauge wires with auxiliary fuses on each line coming from a brand new relay. And we've also went and made a whole new ground and we've got 14 gauge uh, dual grounds, one for each light. So we can show a little bit more of the wiring under the hood when we put the car down, but suffice to say the big thing for those auxiliary, auxiliary lamps is we've run larger gauge wiring, a fresh relay, really nice grounds, and we've gotten rid of the T-taps and the single 16 gauge wire that was feeding them before. Plus, we've made it such that you can actually remove and service those lamps, or if the owner wanted to ever replace them with something else, all we have to do is take the new lamps, 
put a connector on either end that matches what we have in here, and I've got a whole bunch of them. We'll even give one with the car. And then you just plug and play. It'll be ready for any 12 volt accessory up front. All right, so let's talk suspension a little bit. So um, first off, we did the wheel bearings, the front wheel bearings. Um, we did check the backs one more time and they felt fine. Uh, the backs, let me just walk back there and kind of show you. Um, I mean, there's not a whole lot to see here, but we can kind of look at the hub design here. If you look at that, that hub, the uh, rear hubs on these are interesting. They're not exactly serviceable DIY. Now we do have a press and we could technically do them, but the bearings are actually pressed onto the stub axle and you have to press them off. And when pressing them off, you can actually fracture and cause damage to the stub axle. So it's kind of one of those things that even though we do have the tools to do it, if it really needed to be done, I'd probably lean towards getting a rebuilt set that was done by a person or company who does these all the time because they just require a certain amount of finesse that I'd be honest, it would be the first time I'd be doing a set of these and I wouldn't know if I'd have the finesse to do them. I've certainly done a lot of press work and things like that, but I'd almost feel comfortable in the amount of labor involved. It would probably be cheaper in the long run to just set up, uh, to just purchase a rebuilt set of hubs and return the cores. But fortunately I checked them. These are nice and tight. They roll smooth. They should be fine for quite a while, but it is something that as this car goes along, and if you have a TR6, you are going to want to just keep a check on your rear bearings as much as you do the front, because, well, frankly, a lot of these cars are getting old and a lot of these bearings back here are aging, and it is a lot less common because of how complex these are. If you if you say you just bought your car recently, well, it's pretty popular to replace the front ones, and a lot of DIYs do that all the time, but the rear ones are most likely original, and you're going to want to check them out. Now the front ones we did replace and I'll go ahead and look at this one so I'll sort of be on this camera as well. But we did replace the front bearings here and one of the important things that we did is we went with a nice high quality bearing. Now you can buy a bearing kit for like 22 bucks and it comes with the felt seal, cotter pins and the bearings and races that you need. And while those bearings, they seem fine but they're cheap, you know, offshore bearings. Uh, what I did find is that Timken and National both make bearings for this vehicle. They're quite a bit more expensive, but it's worth doing. Timken bearings made in the USA, whereas you can buy a full single side bearing kit for about $22 or $25. Bucks. The actual Timken bearings will range anywhere from $15 to $20 a piece, plus the seal and a few others. You're going to probably spend twice to a little bit more per side, but you're going to get some really good quality bearings. Um, I was actually really happy to see in this car that it had Timken bearings in it when we removed it. Now, I did think, well, maybe all we have to do is adjust the bearings per the factory service manual and be good. But hey, bearings are so cheap, we just don't know how old they are. They could be years old, they could be worn out, and adjusting it might not do it. While we're in here adjusting them, it really isn't a lot of effort to go ahead and replace them. And it's really not that much cost. You're talking about maybe 60 bucks for, for Timken bearings on both sides and you've got brand new bearings in there. Might as well go for it. Cheap insurance, because this is what keeps your wheel attached. Uh, can you hear that? We've got a little bit of play. So, as you can see, got nice tight wheels. The bearings are in. We basically did these to spec. What the book calls for, and if I recall, is you actually tighten the bearings down with the main nut when you're putting them on to five foot pounds. Of course, we used our inch pound. I think that comes out to, you know, 35 inch pounds or whatever. And uh, we torque them to that, and you can feel there's a little tightness in the wheel. And then you back it off to the next uh, hole in, you know, in the castle nut, and go ahead and get your cotter pin in, and they roll really nice nice and tight, properly adjusted. So feeling really good about that. Okay, and then up under the suspension, we did replace one of the steering rack gaiters, they call them, uh, or boot, however you want to call it. I did retain the original, uh, the original clamp on the outside, but on the inside, I went ahead and used a worm clamp. Um, actually, when you buy these, they come with zip ties. Uh, I didn't want to use the zip ties, so I went ahead and used a worm clamp on it. That's out of the way of everything, and that's really nice. Now, uh, let me go and uh, <laughs> let me just talk to the camera again because there's so much to talk about on this. This is another one where it was kind of complicated to do these. That rubber boot, and like when you go to put it on, 
it's pretty easy to slide over the, uh, the tie rod. Now what you're gonna have to do, and I'll come back here and show you. And so basically, when you do these, you can't get the end, this end, to go over your outer tie rod. So you are gonna have to pull off your outer tie rods, which means you're gonna need to mark where this adjuster nut went, and you're pretty much gonna have to take both of them off. I just like to put a piece of tape around here, and then you can thread them off. You can count the threads and get them on exactly where they go. So that's not a huge deal. But then you can go ahead and slide this on, but the other end where it goes in there, it's actually quite a pain to get that up over the end of the rack. What I ended up doing on that, and uh, try to just visualize it, is, is I actually took it and like used a heat gun on the outside of it, uh, the outside of the inner boot, got it nice and pliable and warm, and then I folded it over itself. So kind of inside out, folded it over shoved it on the end and then just went in and rolled it onto where it needed to go. And that actually worked really well. I fought with it for about 45 minutes trying to figure out how to get it to slide in. It was one of those things you could kind of get a piece of it on, but not the whole thing. Finally heating it up, making it a little more pliable and then rolling it, got it on there just fine. And then we were able to get the clamp on. So now we've got a nice clean brand new boot on there. All right, now on this side, this one is, looks like it had been replaced did not too long ago. We checked it out, it's in perfect shape, so it didn't need to be replaced, so we're gonna leave it as is. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And it actually had signs it had been replaced because I don't think you can see with this camera angle, but there's a worm clamp on that end as well. So this one had been replaced, but the one on the other side hadn't. So now both of them are freshened up. Now, as you probably noticed, our tie rods do look pretty new. And uh, well, that's because we went ahead and replaced those as well. Now, originally, I was just gonna replace the rubber boots when we had looked at them. Whoever had put them on never greased the boots. And essentially what happened is the boots were sitting collapsed and had split on the seam, which means they would have been leaking. Even though the tie rods themselves seemed to feel okay, it looked like something that would need to be done. Well, basically, when I pulled them off and when I pulled this one off specifically to replace that, I noticed that the tie rod itself was pretty notchy. So basically what I found is that a whole new set of tie rods was only about 25 or 26 bucks. And the aftermarket boots that I bought are actually for the original style tie rods and don't fit the aftermarket tie rods that all the catalogs sell. So since it's already had aftermarket tie rods, the boots I bought weren't even gonna work. So it kind of made sense since that one was feeling notchy, we'd go ahead and replace them. And that's what we did. So we've got new tie rods on both sides, outer tie rods that is, the inners were in good shape. And uh, as you can see, we're, we've got them in, everything's torqued up and we torqued our jam nut. Now we did have to go through and do the alignment and we found quite a bit of alignment issues with this vehicle and they weren't from us replacing the tie rods because these tie rods are actually identical to the ones we took off. They're the exact same length and we marked all of the positions for our jam nuts when we replaced them. So everything was perfect back where it needed to be. Now what I found when I did the alignment actually made me feel better about one thing. When I was pulling the car into the shop originally to get it up on the lift, I would like aim the steering wheel straight, roll over. I thought the car was coming in straight and then I'd get out and the thing would be crooked. And you could kind of tell the wheels didn't look quite right. So I figured, well, the alignment or at least the steering, uh, the, uh, the steering straightness was off. So maybe the car was aligned, but they never centered the steering wheel. So I figured, hey, we're gonna do a toe alignment on this anyway. I've got some toe alignment plates. These are these aluminum plates that basically go up against the rim. Of course, we took this cover off so we could get a nice straight shot on the actual steel rim. And then I had a, a couple people help me couple measuring tapes, you can get your toe pretty darn close. Now the book calls for anywhere between 1 16th and 1 8 inch of toe in. So basically that would be your wheels towed in slightly. Say this up top is the front, this would be towed in. What I found on the vehicle when I looked at it and we did the initial measurement is that not only was the car towed out quite a bit, it was towed out almost a quarter to a half an inch. So basically the wheels were like this, but they were also skewed to the right which I'm looking in the viewfinder of the camera and uh, uh, I think it might be reversed on here, but it's my right, not your right. <laughs> so 
So essentially the car probably would have driven very skittish on the road. Tow out is going to cause some very skittish handling and basically trying to grab any ruts or imperfections in the road. And then having both tires kind of skewed a little to the right, you'd be fighting the steering wheel to stay straight a little bit. So the alignment took quite a bit to get it into the right straightness. And one of the issues with that is even when you get the tires towed right and then kind of brought over, you still want to make sure that you have both of the tie rods at the same length. So think about it. If you've got the two tie rods and you align them in such a way that now you feel that you're in a good alignment, but one of them is out very far and one's in, they're at different lengths. So when you take a corner, that's a different geometry on either side that it's going to push the wheels. So that can cause all kinds of weirdness and handling difficulties. So I am not an expert in alignments. All I know is I've got these toe plates and I can follow the book and I know how to spin the tie rods and get everything in place. What we were able to do was go ahead and get the tie rods both equal length. We were able to get the toe uh, to just about a sixteenth of an inch, just past the sixteenth of an inch based on the measurements. And uh, we also were able to center the steering wheel. Now centering the steering wheel, you can do that, you know, obviously by popping it off and redoing it, but you don't normally want to do that because if the steering wheel is on straight, that usually means you're doing what I was saying, that you're, you're centering, you're not having the tie rods centered. If the tie rods are centered, your alignment's right, your wheel technically should be on pretty straight. Now this had an aftermarket wheel and it looked to me that they had actually installed it incorrectly because the alignment was so bad it was actually off on the little six uh, allen screws that hold it on to the adapter it was clocked one over we clocked it got it perfect checked it with a level we actually got the steering wheel nice and straight and our alignment is as close as i can get here in the shop i'll probably recommend taking this to a full alignment because i don't have the stuff to do camber and caster and honestly i like my aluminum plates and it gets me close but we're talking about sixteenths of an inch difference here. We're talking about minuscule measurements, literally how tight you hold the measuring tape and uh, whether or not you've got your plates perfectly level and touching the wheel perfectly or any imperfections in the wheel or whatnot, that can throw you off a sixteenth of, of an inch. So really the best way to get a perfect alignment, even though you can get pretty close in your home shop with some of these, these uh, kits, best thing to do is have, a, have it on the vehicle lasers, computers, you know, they dial them in pretty quick. I think we spent about three hours. This was, this one was off so much just to get it right and to get the alignment as close as we could. So this at least will go down the road nice and smoothly, but a full alignment will dial it in just that little bit extra perfect. All right. So of course we did a fluid service. We did drain the oil and we replaced the filter. And also while I was at it, I went ahead and replaced the fuel filter and upgraded the clamps on the fuel filter to some stronger ones instead of just old worm clamps. And uh, let me show you the old filter. You can see why I changed it out. So first of all, I'm not a big fan of these plastic ones. Um, the nice thing about them though, is you can see all of the gunk and rust that ends up in them. And, uh, this, but the thing I don't like about them is I'm always worried about them cracking after heat or leaking. I don't know if that really happens very much, but these things are so cheap. They're like $1.99. And to me, I just prefer to use the, the nice Wix metal ones. And of course the downside of the Wix is you can't see inside of them. Whereas this one, you could definitely see it needed to be replaced, but um, I'm going to throw a spare in the trunk of the car for the owner. And of course, if they ever need it done, I'll take care of it for them. But um, so you would look at this rust and you'd think, gee, well, you know, what's, there's got to be something else going on. What is all this dirt and contaminants in this filter? Well, when I look at the vehicle, the fuel tank has been replaced. It has an alloy fuel tank in it, an aluminum fuel tank. So what I guess is that somebody replaced the fuel tank very recently and didn't replace this filter because there's really no way with a brand new fuel tank. And it is, you look inside, it's nice and clean that you would have this contaminant. It's my guess this is from an old rusty tank. They went ahead and swapped it out, didn't replace the filter. So I think we're going to be in good shape with the new filter. And this is just old stuff left over from the old fuel tank. And now we can toss it in the trash and we got a nice new filter. But that certainly is a consideration if you're just changing your filters out and you see something like that, you should ask yourself, why? <laughs> why is that like that? All right, let's take a look at a few other things that we did. 
So we didn't call out replacing uh, coolant hoses in our original uh, inspection, but as I kind of looked at it closer, some of the lower hoses were very stiff. They looked to be original. And I just went ahead and decided, let's go ahead and replace them because they're extremely inexpensive. And we were planning to replace the coolant anyway. Uh, so it made sense to go ahead and do it. So we've got new lower radiator hoses and a new upper that we'll show you when we get under the hood. Also, we went ahead and replaced the belts. Now the belts looked okay on the car, but sometimes you can't tell until you get them off. Now on closer inspection, I did see a few splits and I said, you know what, another cheap insurance, let's go ahead and do it. They looked older. They did appear to be non-original, but they did look older. When I took them off, and we'll show you a picture, if you turn the belt inside out, you could see the rubber splitting pretty bad. So I'm glad that we caught that, because that's definitely something that could have ruined a day out for the owner. All right, and then we went ahead and replaced the exhaust. Now, if you recall, we found there was a couple of dents in our down pipes here, and we also had a hole in our mid pipe. So we went ahead and bought new and went ahead and replaced those. Now, of course, I did struggle a little bit with our bolts up top. Uh, we had two of them, we were able to get them out after soaking them and heating them, and two of them snapped, which is pretty common. So uh, one of them I was able to eventually extract with some heat, and that was really good, and I felt great. But this one on the top, on the right there, that one we actually had to drill out, and uh, once we drilled it out, we were able to re-tap it and get it bolted in nice and tight and everything's good. So our exhaust is now installed. I reused the original clamps, just cleaned them up a little bit. They looked pretty good and uh, well, it actually turned out I had enough clamps and everything was great because, well, we had extra clamps. And the reason we had extra clamps, because uh, if I recall the ones up here, they were really nasty and we just cut them off and they were, they were rusty and junk. But there was like four of them back here for some reason. And uh, we'll show you some pictures to go along with the video here. But for whatever reason, this car does, I mean, this car is an aftermarket exhaust. Okay, and that's pretty common. But for whatever reason, on our original mid pipe, it stopped like right here, had a couple clamps, and then had like a little section that connected to here with a few clamps. And uh, I really don't know why, because I was worried when I saw that, I went, well, maybe the aftermarket exhaust doesn't line up with the stock exhaust, which makes no sense, because it should have. So I ordered the pipes, laid them out on the ground, and they looked fine. And when I went to install it, it was completely simple. Everything went together perfectly. I did use a little bit of muffler sealant on there just to help with any leaks. We used the original clamps, got everything in. We cleaned up our original hanger here, put a new bolt in it. So we've got this hanger going. Uh, I don't know if you remember in the original clip, everything back here was pretty gross and nasty. We also found that our transmission mount, which was caked in grease, uh, I thought it was just caked in grease and, and oil. And once we cleaned it off, we realized, well, the rubber was actually pretty perished. They were starting the fall. And well, $3.99 per side, we can get new rubber pieces. When I took it apart, we actually found that one of them had split completely through, so definitely glad we did it. So again, something we didn't quite catch in the initial inspection, but as we dug deeper into the car, it was just natural we were gonna clean things up and realize what needed to be done and take care of it. Went ahead and cleaned this up, threw some paint on it, and that's nice and clean as well. Everything's nice and tight. You can see our output shaft, our output seal, on our transmission was actually leaking. So we took the drive shaft out, had the drive shaft rebuilt with new U-joints. We put in new drive shaft bolts and nuts, torqued everything the spec, and of course replaced the seal in our output shaft. And while that was out, that's why we pulled out our transmission mount. So again, while you have certain things out of the way, it makes sense to take care of other jobs. And we definitely found that that was leaking and we went ahead and replaced it with a new seal. We'll of course throw some pictures in as we do our editing. And I did forget something very important. We did some work on the floor. The owner had the floors replaced and we had noted that there was some uh, spot welds that had not been covered with anything and they had some surface rust. So we cleaned them all up, ground them down to bare steel and put some Eastwood rust encapsulator on them. And I also did that on the outside here. So this is all cleaned up just to make sure this thing stays nice and rust free and the work that they had done, which otherwise on this side looked good and the welds looked nice, they just weren't protected. So this will be good to keep it long term. 
Now on this side is where we found up here a kind of like booger weld and a uh, piece of steel that was cut and was left open. Well, we went ahead and seam sealed this entire piece. So all that, that's not weld, that's all seam sealer. So we seam sealed that up, made sure we had a nice uh, tight sealed edge and then went ahead and sprayed all this as well. We did that as well as the outside here. Just made sure everything was nice and protected with rust preventative paint. Now we did put in a couple things. We've got a little drip still happening here. We're gonna go through and just double check that and hope that it's just a minor drip. There's some aspect of these cars that is pretty hard to get rid of every leak. I did put a new copper gasket under there. Um, I'm not sure what else I can do to seal that up. Um, we might look to see if we can do something, but it's just a tiny drip. And hopefully that's all it is, it's just gonna be seepage. That's your speedometer cable. And it looks like probably a replacement cable. And we've got just a little bit of seepage out of there. So again, I've replaced all the sealing items and bits, made it nice and snug without over tightening it. And we still got a little bit of a drip, not on the outside, but through the area where the cable and this turns. So basically this turns independent of the cable. So there's, there's a, a gap basically. And there's a copper sealing washer behind here. And if that's working properly, that'll crush enough and it'll actually seal up to keep the fluid from seeping out. But there's always still a little tiny hole. Now maybe putting a little RTV on there would have solved it and we could try that. But you know, for the time being, that's where we are. Now up here is our re reverse switch. That was leaking as well. well. It was so cheap to just replace it. Uh, we went ahead and replaced it and put two new felt gaskets in. Actually, you have to replace however many felt gaskets are there. I don't know how big of a difference it makes, but since there were two originally, I put two in and I put a little bit of uh, Teflon sealant around the threads as well. And that's so far looking dry. We cleaned up the transmission a ton. It was completely caked with oil. And while we we're at it, we went ahead and replaced uh, the transmission fluid using some synthetic MT90 weight manual transmission fluid from Breadline. And uh, when we pulled the, the drain plug, it is magnetic. There were some bits on it. Um, we're going to hope that everything's good in the long run, but I'll let the owner know that we did find a little bit of debris on the, on the drain plug. I've seen a lot worse. As long as it shifts good, we should be okay. But that's another thing to keep an eye on. Maybe do a fluid service on this sooner rather than later and see how it is. Um, you just never know. And again, this is coming up on a 50 year old car, so it happens. But that is something that we found on there. And well, when it comes to things under the vehicle, I think that was about it. I'm sure there's probably one or two things that I'm forgetting about. And uh, well, maybe we'll add them into the video as we go further. There's definitely a lot more things up top and under the engine bay that we can talk about. But when it comes to things that we did underneath the vehicle, hopefully that was a good walk around of what we did. Like I said, we found a lot of things as we went through it and we did a lot of small jobs on this car. And, like, and again, as I always say, there's a time to take care of certain things. When you have the exhaust out, well, you've got complete access to the back of the transmission. You can do the transmission mount. You can service the U-joints and the drive shaft, which by the way, if I didn't say when we pulled the drive shaft out, we actually found the U-joints were, were stiff on one end. Uh, all the movement was good except one of the movements on the front U-joints. And when we had it in the car, we couldn't really tell that. All you can do is just rock the drive shaft back and forth and look for play. When it's out of the car, you can actually really get a feel for how each one of the bearings in those joint ends are feeling. And I was feeling notchiness in one area and kind of stiff. So once we saw that, I said, hey, a couple of new U-joints, cheap insurance, got the drive shaft out. We can take care of the rear seal. We can do a lot of other stuff because our exhaust was coming out. We knew we could take care of that stuff. All right, we'll go ahead and get the car off the lift. We'll look under the hood for a little bit. And then the rest of the video, we're gonna to have to shoot when we finally finish everything in the car. But I figured what a great opportunity since I think all of our underneath jobs are done. Now remember to stay tuned as we'll have videos showing all the work done under the bonnet and the interior next. Oh, and you'll definitely wanna see the wheels and tires that we put on it. So be sure to drop us a like and subscribe to Vortex Garage to see what's next for this Triumph TR6.